really the two big problems, both at the federal and at the state level. This is entitlements plus retiree costs for federal employees. Payments to individuals, which is a category that OMB tracks in the budget. Peter didn't mention, I used to be deputy director of OMB under George H.W. Bush, the, the, the older President Bush, who's a great guy, by the way. Um, so this is payments to individuals. It was 26% of the budget in 1960. It was half the budget in 1990. It's 64% today. It's grown at 79% above, above inflation. It grew by 79% over the last decade. Obviously, uh, that's faster than the real economy. Here's another way of looking at it over that same period. 1965 is relevant. The first payments, the reason we started in the mid-60s, the first payments made under Medicaid were made in 1962. The first payments under Medicare were made in 1967. So here you take from the mid-60s today, and you just take the US economy in real terms grew by 2.7 times, it nearly tripled. Entitlements grew by 10 and a half times. The total expenditures of the federal government, it's actually a miracle, it didn't, didn't grow that materially more than that. Now, the biggest programs in, in the entitlement category are something you've heard of, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. What, what's happening with each of those? People say, wait a minute, Social Security isn't a problem because we pay into Social Security, we're just getting back what we paid in. So all the years we've been paying into Social Security, it is true, it's going into something called the Social Security Trust Fund. By the way, the, the fiction that it's not being spent every year is fiction. The way the federal government calculates the deficit is, it's cash in every year against cash out. And they have little trust funds all over the place, but the deficit number you hear is just dollars in, dollars out. But anyway, there has been a Social Security trust fund. There has been accumulated cash, that's the blue line, and the red line is the payouts. Right now, where I have the circle, just shows that we're now at the point where the payouts are greater than the money coming in. We're going into cash negative territory. Um, in 2037, 2037, that that trust fund will be at zero balance. There won't be any more money. So you'd be at 100% pay as you go system. Point being, if you did nothing, you'd then have to cut benefits very significantly. Interestingly, even though Social Security is the biggest entitlement program, it is far from being the fastest growing. It only grows about 5% a year. By far, the two that grow much faster are Medicare and Medicaid, which are driven the, by, by the growth of healthcare costs. Now, I don't know, just to be clear, the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. Medicaid is basically for the indigent. It's healthcare for the indigent. Medicare is subsidized healthcare for senior citizens. Okay. Um, as you can see, they're, they're driven by a formula, as I said. They're, they're not subject to review every year. Right? It, you know, as of a couple of years ago, they were 4% of GDP. If you don't touch anything, okay, they'll be 18.5% of GDP 70 years from tonight, when this little one is ready to be a collector. And Laura's baby. Um, but for perspective, that means those two programs would basically be the entire budget, if you just let them go. You, you, hey, you wouldn't have any Social Security, let alone defense. <coughs> Highways or anything else. And to give you perspective on that growth, again, I'm just trying to throw numbers at you that drive home the central point. Here's the growth of Medicare and Medicaid just by themselves over the last 20 years. So, since 1990, the U.S. economy is two and a half times bigger than it was 20 years ago. It's grown by 153 percent, from 5.8 trillion to 14.7 trillion. In the exact same time period, Medicare is four and a half times bigger. And Medicaid is six and a half times bigger. So these are growing at rates that radically outstrip the growth of the overall, overall economy and obviously radically outstrip our ability to pay for it. One of the things people have brought up in Medicaid, for example, in most of the big states, first of all, several things have happened in Medicaid, which is the fastest growing one. One is we've expanded enrollment. There was a big debate recently in Congress. So in, it, it, in the level of enrollment is decided by state, but in many states, people get Medicaid, free medical care, up to 200% of the federal poverty level if you're a parent, and up to 350% of the federal poverty level if you're a child. 350% of the federal poverty level is $62,500, which is more than the median income in the United States. So one of the reasons it's getting so big is we're giving free health care 
to half the children in the United States. In the big states, in New Jersey, where I've done some budget work for Governor Christie, New York, California, that medical care is provided with zero copay and zero deductible. So you can go to the emergency room five days a week if you want. In other words, if you feel, you know, people make the point about incentives, here's the issue about incentives. With zero copay and zero deductible, there's no incentive to take care of yourself. There's no incentive not to be an alcoholic, not to be obese, not to smoke cigarettes, not to shoot heroin. I mean, and, and so as a result, it's both overused and nevertheless, we're still growing in rules. Um, as we've grown the enrollments, we're getting to an interesting point, which has caused some, some concern to people. Um, this is just a, a little bit of data, and I purposely chose 2008 here. This is the percentage of Americans that live in a household that's getting some form of federal entitlement. This includes food stamps in addition to the, the Medicare Medicaid. Um, it's closing out on half of all Americans. And I use 2008 because I, people, I assume, raise their hand and say, well, that's because we had this just big recession and then came enrollments had to go up, or unemployment insurance benefits went up. This is at the top. This is not after the crash. Um, the exact same time, we've had a growth. And again, that's grown from 30%, you know, a couple decades ago. Same exact time, um, here's the percentage of Americans paid out by the income tax, 45%. Again, that's growing even fast. Some people make, you know, some people say, some people worry. But if you get to the point where 50% of Americans pay no income tax and are on an entitlement, then obviously you really have an incentive problem because presumably those people would keep voting for more and more entitlements regardless of incentives or cost controls because it's free. There's no, there's no consequence. Um, now, okay, you say, well, there are companies that have three times their net income in data. So there was an article Peter Arbery showed me when I came in today from the USA Today. There was a, Woman arguing that it's no big deal that our debt is 100% of GDP. There's some people whose debt is a function, some companies, very large, well known companies whose debt is a function of net income as many times. Now. So you think, what are we financing? We're financing the people's ability to consume in the short term. We're financing the current income of half of all Americans, right? That's what we're financing. Spend every year. How are we financing? Well, here's what's interesting. We're taking all this debt. And I showed you that other chart with entitlements plus interest being 60% of the budget. That's carrying interest at $200 billion a year. That's what, if you look in the OMB for FY11 or CBO, the net interest expense is about $200 billion a year. One of the things that's happened in the last just two years to try to cover how expensive that debt is and the cost of servicing it is we've radically shortened the duration of our portfolio of treasuries. The federal government sells treasury bonds to finance that debt. When President Reagan left office, the duration was six years. Today it's three. Why? Well, you know, three year bond, if you look at the newspaper today, was at 0.9%. That's that's the cost of that's the interest you get on a on a three year No, If you the average debt service, because some of this these treasuries were issued a year ago or two years ago, whatever, right now on the whole portfolio is about two percent. And there's money coming in from other trust funds, so that's what gets you the $200 billion. If it was at the today's price of a 30-year bond, your interest expense would be 500 billion. If it was at the price of what's been the average of the 30-year bond for the last decade, 6%, it'd be 750 billion. So we're actually radically understating the cost of servicing the debt every year. Radically understating. By the way, there are other people in the world who say, this is not a time to be financing things with short-term notes because interest rates are the lowest they've been in seven years. I mean, how we have the rate at which the Fed lends money to banks is zero. and has been for two years. I don't think it's going to go below zero. I really don't. And uh, so MIT, the Brainiacs at MIT, they're issuing 100-year bonds. They're issuing 100-year bonds because they think interest rates are so low. So we're going to have a double whammy. If we keep piling up the debt, first of all, the outstanding debt will go up but second of all, the interest rate on that debt will really go up. So interest rate, interest expense as, in, as part of the budget is gonna jump in the next couple of years here from like 200 million a year to like, 200 billion a year, excuse me, to like a trillion a year. So get ready, you heard it here first. Um, now, 
That's the fiscal side of the equation. We're trying to, we're spending an awful lot of money. We're spending three and a half trillion, we're taking in two trillion. We're doing something else on the monetary side because people worry about the effects of the crash we had in 2008. And that is, we're just making it cheaper to borrow money. So we pumped in, in the stimulus program, about 830 billion in the uh, beginning of 2009. Right around that time, March of 2009, people may recall, the, the Federal Reserve announced they were going to jump into the mortgage-backed securities market and buy $2 trillion worth of assets. That's a big number. The, the Fed balance sheet has expanded radically. Then, of course, we've run three years in a row now, a trillion and a half dollar deficit. That's another four and a half trillion. TARP was 700 billion, and instead of paying it back, when the banks paid it back, we rolled it over and spent it on buying <laughs> auto companies and buying AIG, buying a lot of other things. It's probably unclear whether that was intended in the statute. And then most recently, still concerned about the immediate growth of the economy, we have what's called quantitative, quantitative easing two, QE2, which is another. 600 billion of purchases of securities by the Federal Reserve. You just add all that up. The government has pumped, has printed about $9 trillion worth of money in the last two and a half years. And so there's a debate. Well, did we need to do that to keep the economy going? Or is there a risk associated with that? We have never printed $9 trillion of money in anything remotely approaching this period. The, the Federal Reserve balance sheet is basically increased by about 4x. In this, in this period of two years. Um, 